big response that was published by Catholic Family News. Lots of interesting topics that Archbishop Vigano responds to. He he talks about uh, the Society of St. Pius X. He talks about obedience. He talks about the reality of a church and an anti-church. To me, I, I really enjoyed the part where he talked about the abuse that lay people have suffered under. And I'm joined today with my friend Matt Gaspers of Catholic Family News. I just recently published this, and we're going to talk about the contents of this document. Matt Gaspers, how are you today? Doing well, Taylor. Thanks for having me back. It's great to be back. I know back in June we were talking about the hermeneutic of continuity with our wonderful little uh, drawing, the horse. <laughs> there he is. There he is on the screen. The hermeneutic of continuity of horse. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's great to have you back. It's been a while. It's been a few months, and uh, this is I, this is a big get for uh, Catholic Family News. So, congratulations, Matt Gasper, oh, thank the you. whole team there, and Mister. Is it pronounced Cox? Is that how you say his name? Yeah, Stephen Cox. Yeah. He's actually employed by LifeSite News, but he writes for us occasionally. Good. A very solid, traditional Catholic man, and the reason why he wrote the article he did, which is what Archbishop Vigano was responding to, the title is called "Questions for Vigano." His Excellency is right about Vatican II, but what does he think, <clears throat> excuse me, Catholics should do now? Mm -hmm. And this was published on August 22nd, the Feast of Our Lady's Immaculate Heart. So basically, uh, Mr. Cox and CFN, by extension, were just hoping for some practical counsel and guidance from His Excellency regarding what the faithful on the ground, and even clergy for that matter, lower clergy, should be doing in the midst of what we're going through. Yeah, awesome. Well, let's pray. Pray our, our Father, our Pater Noster, and then uh, we'll just jump right into it. I've, I've read through it a couple times. I've highlighted <clears throat> some key areas that I want to discuss. Ask your opinion, Matt. I'll share some of my thoughts as well. Uh, because, you know, Vigano's been having a steady output of documents. They're always good. They're always they great. Are. I love them, you know. And, and this one especially had some things that, uh, you know, he was he was kind of raw. You know, he, he really came forward on some controversial issues like Archbishop Lefebvre, etc. So let's begin with our prayer. We'll pray the Pater Noster. Matt, do you want to pray the second half? Sure, we'll do. All right, oremus. In nomine Patris et Filii et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Pater Noster, qui es in celis, sanctificator nomen tuum, adveniat regnum tuum, fiat voluntas tua, sicut in cello et in terra. Panem nostrum quotidianum da nobis hodie, et dimite nobis debita nostra, sicut et nos dimitimus debitoribus nostris, et ne nos inducas in tentationem, sed libera nos a malo. Amen. Nomine Patris, et Filii, et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. St. Pius X. Pray, Pray for us. us. All right. Well, uh, if y'all want to follow along, and I think you probably should, so open up another tab in your computer. And if you're on YouTube, you can just go uh, directly beneath us, and there's the link to the article and the statement by Vigano over at Catholic Family News. I'll also ask our moderators to place it into the live chat. If you're on Facebook or Twitter or Periscope watching from there, um, welcome. Uh, you know, we've been doing this for the last couple of months. And uh, please um, just search uh, Catholic Family News. It's the most recent article right there at the top. You can click that and then you can just follow along in the text uh, with us. And I would like to say also before we get started, YouTube has been biting down on me a little bit, Matt Gaspers. Mm. And mainly since I started working with the Catholics for Trump, and et cetera. So I've been asking. Imagine that. Right? Yeah, imagine that. <laughs> So I've been asking people to also follow me on Periscope. It's an app. It's a, a video app where I do live videos. And I do some stuff that I don't even put on YouTube over there on Periscope. So it's just another platform. And I greet everybody watching over at Periscope. So you can download that app and you can get more live videos that I'm doing. It's totally free. But, you know, nice. you, at, at this time, Matt guess we've got to diversify our, right. our platforms because... Big um, Brother is watching. YouTube may not always be a platform. So... Um, you know, we're, right now I'm triple streaming on, you and I are both on YouTube, Facebook streaming, and Twitter Periscope streaming. Wow. So we're all over. So welcome, everybody. And um, if you're new, please please subscribe. Please like the video. And, and let's get started, Matt. So right. this uh, it came out September 1st. 
Is that right? That's the date on it? Yep. Yesterday, yep. And uh, it's a response to Mr. Cox, Stephen Cox. That's how you say his name? Yes. Mm -hmm. Good. And um, it begins with a question about, you know, Archbishop Vigano has said there's problems with Vatican II. He says we should forget the council. I think there's probably two ways in which we can do that. One is to say, well, yes, it was a council, but it had no anathemas, no canons, no infallible dogmas. So it's just right. sort of there and we forget about it. And then right. another another viewpoint would be that a future point actually repudiates the whole council. And uh, I've asked a couple of times in the videos to Archbishop Vigano, which which one do you mean? Uh, I'm not completely sure. Maybe the latter. But this is a practical question that Mr. Cox asks to Archbishop Vigano. What does it mean to separate from the Catholic Church according to the supporters of the council is the reverse question that Vigano begins with, which is interesting. He's like, we're not the ones leaving the church. The heretics are the ones leading, leaving the church. Exactly. The, so the question that um, Mr. Cox posed, among several others, in his original article for CFN, which again was published on August 22nd, he asked Vigano, quote, what would separating from the, quote, conciliar church look like in Archbishop Vigano's opinion? And then Vigano begins his response, as you mentioned, by asking a counter question, what does it mean to separate from the Catholic church according to the supporters of the council? Because basically the claim by the supporters of the council is that if you don't accept the council whole and entire, every jot and tittle, then you're somehow separating yourself from the Catholic Church, or you're not in their their favorite phrase, full communion with the Catholic Church, whatever that means. Right. Um, so I do think for a starting point, this whole issue of uh, the phrase conciliar church is something worth maybe spending a couple minutes on to help people understand the terminology, uh, because it is kind of a controversial term, even within the Society of St. Pius X. A lot of people uh, mistakenly think that the term originated with Archbishop Marcel Lefebvre, the uh, founder of the society. But interestingly, if you read his biography, I know you have read it. Uh, it's a it's a massive book. I've got my copy right here. Where's mine? Mine's over there. Oh, no I worries. Got, I got one. But you can see his. Yeah, the Tissier so, biography. Correct. So in this biography, it actually details the true origin of the term conciliar church and believe it or not it actually comes from a vatican official uh, specifically the deputy secretary of state archbishop giovanni benelli so he was under cardinal Ca uh, who was it cardinal Vilo, yep. someone you mentioned in your book infiltration not a good guy yeah exactly yeah so so just so y'all know cardinal Vilo is the guy that I think there is pretty good evidence. He was definitely the first one who came and cleaned up the papal apartment when John Paul I died after being pope for 33 days. And people who believe that John Paul I was murdered, like Malachi Martin and others say, uh, believe that Cardinal Vilo was the one who orchestrated it. So, uh, And also Cardinal Vilo was also the one behind the Vatican Bank scandal of the, of the 60s moving into the 70s. He was... Uh, the main guy. So that's Cardinal Vilo. Yes, and uh, his successors in that office have also been equally very bad news. Cardinal, the Secretary of State has been thoroughly infiltrated. Double thumb down on those, yeah. Yeah. So regarding this... Term, and I, I, can I add there, Matt? Oh, I was sure, surprised. I had always thought... I never liked the term conciliar church. I think it is a little confusing. People are using... And I again, I thought it was a Lefebvre term and Lefebvre does use it. So right. I had always assumed that Lefebvre was the originator of it. But then I learned that no, that terminology was actually being used by modernist, semi-modernist Catholics Correct. in the that, 70s to refer to the post-Vatican II church, the conciliar right. church. So and when they say the conciliar church, point. they mean the Vatican II church. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly right. And that's why Arch so Archbishop Lefebvre used it in kind of an ironic way, like turning it back on them, like, okay, you want me to join this conciliar church or be loyal to the conciliar church, 
which is essentially what Archbishop Benelli was asked, was demanding of him in a June 25th, 1976 letter. So this was right before the ordinations, uh, June 29th, 1976, when Lefebvre got uh, suspended, so-called a, a divinis, for going through with those ordinations. And here's what he said after the, about a month after the ordinations, he said, quote, uh, a good sense of humor on Lefebvre's part. He says, when all is said and done regarding the suspension, the suspension forbids me to say the new mass or to give the new sacraments. <laughs> so, right. so he's essentially saying he's only uh, forbidden. He's not actually forbidden from the true mass, the true sacraments. He goes on to say, I am asked to obey the so-called conciliar church, as Archbishop Benelli calls it. But this conciliar church is schismatic because it breaks with the Catholic Church of all time. It has its new dogmas, its new priesthood, its new institutions, and its new liturgy, which have already been condemned in so many official and definitive documents. So there's Archbishop Lefebvre's explanation of the term conciliar church. And something else occurred to me when I was preparing for our show today that I think a great reference point for understanding uh, the con a conciliar church is not like a whole separate, different entity per se. Chris Ferrara, in his excellent book, The Great Facade, with his co-author um, was Thomas Woods, in chapter three of that book, which I know you've recommended before to your viewers and you've had Chris on to discuss it, in chapter three, they discuss what they call viruses within the mystical body. And I think I that's the that. key to understanding uh, the true understanding of conciliar church. There you go. I've got my copy here as well. Yep. yep. See, I keep all this right here. I got a DJ. MC, exactly right. MC. DJ Dewey so, Rames. Specifically, the viruses that they use the analogy of a virus in reference to the novelties introduced at the council, specifically like ecumenism, dialogue, the new liturgy. They say those are the three basic elements of un of the unparalleled post-conciliar innovation of the church. As they explain in here, just as, the, uh, just as a virus can't really exist on its own, it has to have a living cell, a host yes. to feed off of. That's, exact, that's essentially what this conciliar church thing is. It doesn't exist apart from the true Catholic church. It's, it's an infiltration of the church, and it's a, almost like a possession of the church. Yeah, it's by, a parasite. Yeah, a par there you go, a yeah. parasite. It, the the of course the church the gates of hell will never prevail over the church the one true church of christ one holy apostolic catholic church in union with the bishop of rome and the apostolic see will never cease to exist until the second coming of christ but right. this false church i like the term anti-church yeah because there's going to be an anti-christ there's an anti-church this, and this anti vegan, I was just going to say, Vigano has also used uh, the language of a parallel church. That's the language Correct. he used in his original, his June 9th statement, which which got this debate about the council going in full full steam back in uh, early June. Yep. And you, from an outsider, you know, if you brought someone from another planet to here and you took and you had them, you know, sit down and read the Catechism of Trent or read the letters of, let's say, Pius V and Pius X, and then you had them read the letters of Francis, and you'd say, uh, you know, are these the same religion? I think that that outsider objectively would state, no, they're not. And then you had them attend like a traditional Latin mass, and then attend just an average Novus Ordo, randomly picked, right? So you don't right. get to say the Reverend Novus Ordo. At, we're going to put all the Novus Ordos in a, in a basket like, the like uh, bingo. motto, yeah, or bingo, and then we're just going <laughs> to randomly choose one, right? Random, and we can do the random TML too, just to make it make it fair, and then right. put them side by side and say, is this the same? And I think obviously people would see similarities, just as you would see similarities if you compared it to Lutheranism or Episcopalianism. Right. But there is a serious difference, and it, it kind of goes back to that that hermeneutic of continuity picture that we always talk about. Right. Yes, the back half of the horse and the front half of the horse, you put them together, you can say there's a horse there, but there's clearly a distinction, right. a clear distinction. And in 2020, everybody not only sees it, but they feel it. 
Yes. So here's how Vigano described it back in early June. He said, uh, it is undeniable that from Vatican II onwards, a parallel church was built, superimposed over and diametrically opposed to the true church of Christ. So again, like you said, a parasite leeching or latching itself on to the true mystical body of Christ. He says, quote, this parallel church progressively obscured the divine institution founded by our Lord in order to replace it with a spurious entity corresponding to the desired universal religion that was first theorized by masonry. So it's something that exists as a parasite within the mystical body, but technically speaking, it's not like there literally are two different churches with two different hierarchies. And Archbishop Vigano makes that clear in his new statement in answer to CFN. He describes, quote, a strange, extravagant church coexists like wheat with the tare in the Roman Curia, in dioceses, in parishes. Yes. So there are elements of what he calls in his letter to uh, President Trump the deep church. There are elements of the deep church throughout the mystical body of Christ around the world. Yeah, yeah so we have deep church, anti-church, conciliar church, parallel church, are there any other terms that we missed there? They all refer to the same thing. Right. Different ways of, of making an analogy of, of what they what we're talking about here. And how I understand it, I mean I'm I don't claim to be an expert on this subject, but my understanding is that the so called conciliar church is essentially composed of modernists or those who are at least modernist minded to varying degrees of culpability within the true church, especially within the hierarchy who, in the words of Vigano, quote, usurp the Catholic name. Yes. And this is what I call infiltration. Yes. You know, the Jesus Christ installed filters, as you have filters on your swimming pool, to get yes. the debris, debris out of your pool so that your pool is crystal clear and healthy and the kids can swim in it and have fun all summer. But if someone rips those filters or damages those filters, or even removes the filters, suddenly your pool gets cloudy, and there's algae and all kinds of problems going on yep. there. And that's what we're talking, the church has always had filters to protect the faithful and the hierarchy. And what we saw happening beginning in the 1800s and then into the early 1900s, mm -hmm. decades before Vatican II, is the filters were tampered with. And now yep. we have cloudy water in the pool. And there's people like myself and Matt Gaspers and others who are saying, look at the pool's cloudy, the pool's cloudy. And everyone's saying, you're a schismatic, you're a heretic, you're outside the church. I'm like, the pool's cloudy, there's something wrong with the filters. Let's let's work on the filters. Let's get back to the old filters. So our pool's right. clean again. You're a schismatic, you hate the Pope, you hate the church, you're a Protestant. That's what we hear. Yep. And Vigano addresses that very, uh, very well in his letter. I was going to see if I could find that quote real quick. He talks about the blame should not be with faithful Catholics. Here, I'm going to find the quote real quick here. Uh, let's see. Is this in, in today's today's doc? It is, yeah. So he taught. He uses the. Uh, here we go. Here's what he says. Let's stop fearing that the fault of the schism lies with those who denounce it. So in other words, those who are saying the water's cloudy, we're yeah. not causing the cloudy yeah. water. We're simply observing it and, and recognizing it and shouting out about it. Mm -hmm. He says, let's stop fearing that the fault of the schism lies with those who denounce it and not instead with those who carry it out. The ones who are schismatics and heretics are those who wound and crucify the mystical body of Christ not those who defend it by denouncing the executioners, exclamation mark. Thank you, Archbishop Vigano. Thank yes. you. People need to understand that those of us who are decrying the, uh, the sexual abuse, the liturgical abuse, the dogmatic abuse, the errors in moral theology, you're looking at two of them right now, but there's thousands more of you. We are not fostering a schism. We no. don't want a schism. I am 100% faithful to the one Holy Catholic and Apostolic Church by the grace of God. I don't want to swim in a cloudy pool, and I don't want my kids in a cloudy pool. 
Let's get, let's get some filters going. All right. And Vega knows the same way. He's saying the same thing. But unfortunately, the modernists are telling everyone else, we're the schismatics. Right. We're no, the no, problem. No, no, no. You don't get to play that. And I love that Vigano is defending himself and us. Before we move on, I want to define modernist because I often assume that the audience knows the term modernist. But we got to clarify it. All right. Sure. Pope Pius X, he had identified the summary of all heresies called modernism. Modernism does not mean that we're against um, phones and cars and modern medicine or anything like that. Right. The, the heresy of modernism. It's so all in the ism. <laughs> all in the ism. The heresy of modernism is the error that the Catholic faith and the Catholic Church and the Catholic liturgy and the moral theology and the dogma must be updated regularly right. or at all. It must be, to use a term, modernized. Right. Always modernized. So they say, well, the way Catholicism was in 1820 doesn't work in 2020. This is what you see lib liberal Jesuits doing. Well, that was the 1820s Catholicism. Now we have the 2020 Catholicism or the right. 1520. Well, now we have the 2020. It's kind of like, you know, a Chevy Corvette. Right. You know, it's kind of the same model, but about every seven years or so, they put a new, new body shape on it, new engine, new everything, right? Make it better. This is modernism. Yep. Catholicism must be changed. Now, I said the other day, the reason I'm a Catholic is because the Catholic dogma and the morals never, let me say it three times, never, never, never change. What was wrong in 33 AD is wrong in 2020, every jot and tittle. And yep. the dogma that Jesus gave the 12 apostles on AD 33, when he ascended into heaven mm -hmm. on Thursday, Ascension Thursday, all the dogmas that they believed and held are still true 100% in 2020. There is no change. That's right. It's true that we do develop a vocabulary like transubstantiation, consubstantial, trinity, etc. But it doesn't change or modernize or update the dogma. So, correct. If you're a modernist, you interpret all of Catholicism for 2,000 years in light of today, this pope, and the most recent council, Vatican II. So you can only you only understand Trent or Nicaea through the goggles of Vatican II. That's a modernist. A traditionalist like Matt Gaspers and myself, we interpret today, 2020, in light of the 2000 years before us. See, tradition yeah. gets the privilege, not today. Today right. is held suspect. The tradition right. before us gets the privilege and gets the final veto. Did I get that right, Matt? Absolutely. I was just going to add uh, a document that I highly recommend all viewers read because it really sums up what modernism is and what needs to be rejected is the oath against modernism by Pope St. Pius X which is available online. I'm looking at it right now on papalencyclicals.net. And he says, quote, this is what the, the, the person who, uh, uh, the cleric or the religious or anybody who's going to have a position in the church publicly takes this oath. Part of it, they say, is, quote, I sincerely hold that the doctrine of faith was handed down to us from the apostles through the Orthodox fathers, the right teaching fathers of the church, in exactly the same meaning and always in the same purport or the same sense. That's the crucial part. Yep. Then he goes on to say, therefore, I entirely reject the heretical misrepresentation that dogmas evolve and change from one meaning to another different from the one which the church had, had uh, held previously. So that's the crucial point. Absolutely. And I, you don't know this about me, Matt Gaspers, I have taken the official Pius X oath against modernism at the altar of a Catholic church during a traditional Latin mass. I have made awesome. that oath and that's why I'm a warrior against modernism because I have made that oath and I believe I received graces 
from the altar of Christ to fight against modernism, the summary of all heresies. Right. Because essentially, in this same quote from the Oath Against Modernism, before we move on, uh, St. Pius X sums up what modernism thinks of the faith. They think of it as a, quote, philosophical figment or a product of a human conscience that has gradually been developed by human effort and will continue to develop indefinitely. That's modernism in a nutshell. Which is naturalism, yeah. Yeah, so exactly. That's just saying what we think about God is just sort of the bubbling up of our minds and our consciousness with the transcendent. And since man is always developing over time, civilization is developing, therefore our consciousness and thinking of God is always developing. So let's update it. The old liturgy, that doesn't speak to the man of 1965, Matt Gaspers. We got to make a new liturgy. Yep. And now they're talking, Matt, about doing a new Novus Ordo, the Novus Novus Ordo. Yep. And, of course, the Amazonian rite, whatever that's going to be. Bunch Ugh. of pacha idols and demons in that. Yep. You want demons? That's how you get demons. Bring idols into the house of God, and you will have a haunted house. It won't be a church anymore. It'll be a haunted house. Mm -hmm. All right, let's get into this. I want to go over some of these uh, quotes here and, and get your take on them. Sure. Uh, Matt Gaspers. The first one is towards the beginning of the letter where he states that um, instead what needs to be clarified is the position of those who declaring themselves Catholic embrace the heterodox doctrines that have spread over these decades with the awareness that these represent a rupture with the uh, preceding magisterium. In this case, it is licit to doubt their real adherence to the Catholic Church, in which, however, they hold official roles that confer authority on them. It is an illicitly exercised authority if its purpose is to force the faithful to accept the revolution imposed since the council. So here he's talking about false shepherds. Yep. And also the danger of, of giving false obedience. That, that's what we're, that's the right. virtue involved here is the, the moral virtue of obedience. And as St. Thomas mentions, I'm sure you're familiar in the Summa, uh, you can, with all the moral virtues, you can have an error of excess or an error of defect. And it is possible to give obedience when it's not legitimate to do so. And that's part of the whole traditionalist, the controversy among the, with the traditionalist movement. And that's why we're often um, demonized as being schismatic is that we don't give absolute unqualified obedience in all situations. Correct. But that's not actually what is required of us. In fact, that's actually sinful to give obedience when it's not legitimate. Yes. Let me give an example. You know, there's, there's righteous anger and unrighteous anger. So, for example, when Christ cleared the temple because people were buying and selling, he, was, he had righteous anger. No sin. He was sinless. Uh, when we think about abortion, there should be a righteous anger. Not an unrighteous anger, but a righteous anger. So you can have yes. righteous obedience and unrighteous obedience. So if the Nazi officer says, I want you to shoot those 12 people, and you're like, well, I have to be obedient to civic authority, that's unrighteous obedience. If, a, no. if the cardinal, your cardinal said to you, put the crucifix on the ground and trample it. You can't say, well, I got to obey the bishop. That's Catholicism. You see that? That's an unrighteous obedience. Right. Now, as we move away from there, it gets a little bit more unclear and cloudy and gray. But there is the principle in Catholicism that we don't have to obey an unrighteous command. Or even right. one, I would say, if it's contrary to reason and the common good, it was it's not necessarily evil per se. I, I'm not so sure. You know, like if, if your bishop said, I want all the men in the diocese, every time they come to mass, they have to wear a pink ribbon on their head to show that they're in favor of breast cancer research or something stupid like that. <laughs> right. I don't think we would be obliged under obedience to our bishop to all wear pink ribbons on top of our heads. Right, Matt? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's, it's contrary to reason, contrary to the common good. I and agree. once we understand this, see, this is something that's very misunderstood in the traditional movement. It divides the traditional movement because you have people who are following and expressing a truly 
Catholic principle. You obey the Pope, you obey the magisterium, and you obey the bishop. Yes. But there is an exception there that you mentioned Thomas Aquinas talks about. If right. it's sinful, contrary to reason, contrary to the common good, you do not obey it. And also if it's contrary to the faith, that's that's the really important point in our context, which I think Archbishop Vigano is is emphasizing that if it's contrary to the faith, if it's going to damage your faith, he gets into that a little bit in discussing, you know, going to masses which in which there is sacrilege and, and horrible abuses that we are not obliged to participate in that. Yes. Yes. Um, he says, uh, instead, what needs to be clarified is the position of those who declaring themselves Catholic. Oh, sorry, I already read that part. The next part is, it is evident that it is not the traditional faithful, that is true Catholics, in the words of St. Pius X, that must abandon the church, in which they have full right to remain, to remain, and from which it would be unfortunate to separate, but rather the modernists who usurp the Catholic name precisely because it is only the bureaucratic element, bureaucratic element, that permits them not to be considered on par with any other heretical sect. So I think here, James Martin, S.J., he and, J and Joe Biden, they use the name Catholic, even yep. though they do not carry the faith and the morality of the Catholic faith in the church. And they use that term to then promote evil and attack the faithful. This is the problem. Right. And I think the proof of that would be if you asked James Martin to take the oath against modernism, I don't think he would do it because that's not what he believes. Yep. I don't think Joe Biden would take it either. I mean, maybe I don't know what he believes or what he's capable of understanding at this point, but I don't I don't think that's what they hold. No. No. Um, he says, but just as it is not possible to claim citizenship in a homeland in which one does not know its language, law, faith and tradition, so it is impossible that those who do not share the faith, morals, liturgy, and discipline of the Catholic Church can arrogate to themselves the right to remain within her, even to ascend the levels of the hierarchy. So just because you, you say, I'm an American, it doesn't mean you're American unless you actually are one. Just because you say you're a Catholic, Joe Biden, doesn't mean you are one. Right. Absolutely right. And I think that was Archbishop Lefebvre's point that he made over and over throughout the years is that why am I being reprimanded for doing everything the same? I did. This is exactly what I did for decades in Africa when I was a missionary. Why is it? Why is it now wrong and banned and forbidden, et cetera? That doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Matt, can you hear the saw in the background right now? A, a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> There's some guys working on our. Fixing our floor downstairs, and I didn't know that. Oh, I saw gotcha. I didn't know if the mic would pick that up. I apologize <laughs> to everyone about that. Um, he also talks about the motu proprio sumorum pontificum yes. that reaffirmed that the faithful and the priests yes. have an inalienable right. He uses inalienable right here. <laughs> very, very Americana, Archbishop Vigano, <laughs> which cannot be denied. denied. And we have seen this rolled back in the last few years, haven't we, Matt, where priests are told you can't say the TLM, can't say the Latin Mass, sorry. Right. And it's also concerning, you know, what was it in, I think it was in January of 2019, so last year, that Pope Francis decided to abolish the Pontifical Commission Ecclesia Day and kind of absorb it. I mean, it was already under the auspices of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, but it was still its own office. But now it's been absorbed entirely into the CDF, and there's concerns that uh, some of the legal framework that Benedict XVI laid down to protect the rights of the faithful is going to is basically being removed and obliterated by Francis. Right. Now I, I have a different theory on that a little bit, Matt. Um, Ecclesia Dei traditionally has been, I mean, that was the, that was the document against Lefebvre. Ecclesia Dei. That's where it got its name. Yeah, right? and and so I, I've I've my suspicion is that the absor the man it's loud down there, the absorption of Ecclesia Dei in the CDF it was already in the CDF, um, was in a way an olive branch to the Society of Saint Pius X. That's how I read it. Right, and but I think that's how it was basically was presented. I think right. there 
con- some people are concerned that it might just be a facade or a, a, mm-hmm. uh, a veneer for something a little more sinister. Or time will tell, I guess. We'll see what correct. happens. Correct, correct. But yeah, I mean, there's there's been, over the years since uh, Simorum Pontificum was published in 2007, uh, and it's there have been documents subsequent to that that have def- more clearly defined the rights of the priests and the faithful, but there are still yeah. obstinate bishops bishops who probably are um, components of this conciliar church, you could say, the parasite, uh, that are, they'll do anything and everything they can to prevent people from getting to the traditional mass. Yep. Because they they know what the stakes are. They know, they know that it attracts young people, for one. Yep. And they don't want that. They are so committed to their, their 60s revolution, they won't let it go. Just won't. Tam- it's God. very it's like very sad. Hey, Mr. Tambourine. <laughs> I mean, give me a break. Yeah, they put the the TLM tradition. When I, we say TLM, we mean traditional Latin mass. I've been saying TLM so much, Matt. People I saw on Twitter thought my middle initial was L. Oh, <laughs> I'm like no, no, no. I'm not talking that. about <laughs> talking about TM. That's it's talking funny. about traditional Latin mass. TLM. TLM. They'll put them. Traditional Latin masses are notoriously hidden in the hood, in the ghetto. They're in the worst part of town, hard to get to. They put them at the worst times for family, the worst time ever being like three or four p.m. on Sunday. Yep. How do you, as a fan, you you have kids? I got kids. That's a rough go to get your kids to mass at three or four p.m. if you want the TLM, and then they just make it living Hades for these priests to be able to serve these communities. And then they throw other obstacles like, well, during Holy Week, you can't do the TLM. You got to do the Novus Ordo for, for Maundy Thursday, Good Friday, Holy Saturday. These kind of, all these, kind, this kind of nonsense. Right. But Pope Ben XVI and Sumorum Pontific, Pontificum, according to Vigano, gave an inalienable right for the traditional books. The, and it's not just the traditional Latin Mass. It's all, count them up, seven sacraments. That's right. And the exorcisms. And other traditional right. li- rites like churching of the women, the betrothal rite. All you mm-hmm. young, young trads, when you get engaged or you're going to get engaged, get betrothed. Follow the traditional betrothal rite. When you have a baby, women, go through the churching of the women. It's beautiful, beautiful liturgy. Mm-hmm. <sighs> Absolutely. I love what he says uh, in that same paragraph that you're talking about, Samorum Pontificum. He also he ends that paragraph by saying this right must be used today. In other words, the right to to offer on the part of clergy and to attend on the part of laity, the traditional Latin mass. This right must be used today, not only and not so much to pre- simply preserve the ex- so-called extraordinary form of the right, but to testify to adherence to the deposit of faith, the, the depositum fidei, that finds perfect correspondence only in the ancient rite. So it's not simply that we're clinging to it based on nostalgia, lex orandi, lex credendi. There, there are real, uh, there's real stuff at stake here as far as if you attend the new mass versus the traditional mass, there's a formation going on with each of those, a spiritual formation that is in many ways, substantially different from each other. And that's a very serious problem, especially for our children. Yeah. Yeah. This thing is growing. They don't want it to grow. It was, you know, it's kind of originally like, oh, well, some old folks are going to want that old Latin mass. But you go to a traditional Latin mass, what do you see, Matt? Everywhere. Young families. Babies. That's why I say if your mass ain't crying, it's dying. There are babies yep. crawling everywhere. I like to joke when I was at mass uh, with you. Yeah. The first time we ever met, actually. That's right. The first met time you and I met in person uh, was almost a year ago. And we were at the CIC conference and we met in the Narthex right as the ma- that uh, Arch, uh, sorry, that Bishop Athanasius Schneider was leading. Yep. Uh, celebrating. And you kind of came over and said, hey, we shook hands, but the mass had already started. But during, right. we were in the narthex, I literally had babies crawling over me. I was kneeling in the mass, crawling over the backs of my calves. <laughs> there was babies coming up and like looking at me. There was so many moms and babies in the narthex that you couldn't, you couldn't move. 
And I'm not yeah. exaggerating. I'm talking about dozens and dozens of babies. Right, Matt? That's right. Baby fest. That's right. Because the Holy Ghost brings about life. He's the Lord and giver of life. Now, speaking of Bishop Sch Schneider, I really liked how the good Archbishop Vigano took his hat off to Bishop Schneider here. I was just going to say that. And yep. compared him to the great St. Athanasius of yep. Alexander. Do you want to read that or you want me to read it? Sure, I'll go ahead. It's as my so venerable he, brother, that one. Yep. As my venerable brother, Bishop Athanasius Schneider, has many times recalled the Arianism that afflicted the church at the time of the holy doctor of Alexandria in, in Egypt was so widespread among the bishops that it leaves one almost to believe that the Catholic that Catholic orthodoxy had completely disappeared. But it was thanks to the fidelity and heroic testimony of the few bishops who remained faithful that the church knew how to get back up again. And I think there's an obvious parallel to our own times. There's only a handful of bishops who are willing to stay the things that Archbishop Vigano is saying, among them, of course, Bishop Athanasius Schneider. Yes. And uh, I mean, we love both these bishops. They have a, a little bit of difference on how to solve the untie the knot of Vatican II. But right. both are in agreement that there are erroneous slash ambiguous statements in the documents of Vatican II that are dangerous to the faith. Both of them hold right. that. Um, and it's something that you and I both hold as well. It's something that Archbishop Lefebvre also held. And it's becoming more and more of a consensus within the, um, the traditional understanding, which in 2020, you know, there's been a bit of a war uh, breaking out over... This, you know, do we take a hermene a hard hermeneutic of continuity or do we just finally throw up our hands? Jesus, take the wheel. Uh, there's some problems here in Vatican II and we have to just we, you know, we have to admit that we've got some problems here and we have decades right. of theological, moral and liturgical abuse to prove it. Right. And I would add to that, I mean, with all due respect, um, I think it, the, the onus to prove that the hermeneutic of continuity actually works is on those who have proposed it as the solution. It's mm -hmm. not on those who are saying there's a problem. Um, and that's, that's my issue with the hermeneutic of continuity. Uh, in 2011, there was an excellent, very respectful petition submitted to Benedict XVI, uh, signed by, among others, Professor Roberto de Mattei, and also a, a renowned Roman theologian named Monsignor Brunero Girardini, who has since gone to his eternal reward, basically asking, you know, if you say that there's a that a hermeneutic of continuity is the answer, please demonstrate it in practical terms. Show us the continuity between yes. X, Y, and Z, and the tradition of the church. And if you can't do that, you have to be honest about that and admit it. Yeah. And unfortunately, that petition was never answered. And I think that speaks volumes that it was never answered. The hermeneutic of continuity is simply barely, it's asserted as a bare assertion, but it's not actually demonstrated. And that's the problem. Yeah. Yeah. So often we heard, up and even till recently, we need to create the hermeneutic of continuity. Well, we've had since 1965. Right. <laughs> exactly. We need to create it. It's like, well, right. we need to we need to endeavor. We need to work on this. It's like, I've tried it. Go back and listen to my old my old podcast from two thousand. I've been podcasting since two thousand thirteen. Go listen to my stuff from two thousand thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen. You can hear me doing it. You can hear me trying to make the things fit. And right. I would say I would say things like this, Matt. Well, when you read this, it makes you think this, but that can't be right. So we must rather understand it if we understand these terms in this way, right? Or if we understand this Latin word in this way, we can mold it into an orthodox sense. You know, right. for example, Lumen Gentium saying that the Muslims adore God, no biscum, with us. Right. right. That, Together that, that with takes us. some tangling. I know how to try to make it fit. I know, I know how to try. I've done it, I've done it in public. Right. But at a certain point, when you see Francis creating, issuing the Abu Dhabi document and then creating the Abrahamic shrine 
of Jews, Muslims, and Catholics all going to worship together, you realize that uh, that they adore the god Nobiscum. You you realize Francis really wanted to be Nobiscum, really wanted to be with us. And Francis himself says that that his human fraternity document doesn't depart one millimeter. That's the word he used on the on the plane ride home to Rome after that mm. after he signed the document. It doesn't depart one millimeter from the Second Vatican Council. Right. So is he wrong, or is he right? Yeah. He he he. His hermeneutic is saying that he is not one millimeter off. Correct. So, if that's what you want, if if you want. To sit down and say Sunday's mass was beautiful when Father offered the mass to Muhammad's God, Allah. If, if you're comfortable talking like that, I'm not, mm-hmm. and I don't think Catholics for two thousand years would be comfortable saying that. But you know, I thought it was nice that he 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 uh, gave a shout out here to Bishop Athanasius Schneider, compared him to, in a way, to Athanasius, and then compared our problems now where we have what seems to be a majority of bishops sympathetic to modernism or semi-modernism i've been using the word semi-modernist more lately just as there's arianism they denied that christ was god I and mean, there right. were semi-arians who were like well i don't really know if i want to accept nicaea or the nicene creed but jesus is sort of divine and they kind of they were all you know Floating back and forth over the boundaries of orthodoxy and heresy. Ultimately, of course, you can't do that. That's heretical. But right. we see that happening in our day, too, where people will say, well, you know, you know, I like the old mass or, yeah, I think the Bible's inerrant and infallible. But, you know, I don't I don't know about this book or maybe Christ mm-hmm. didn't really multiply the loaves. Maybe that was just, you know, people sharing and caring. The miracle. Which Pope Francis has said publicly, by the way. Yeah, I know. Didn't want to mention that, but yeah. <laughs> okay, so now he turns in the letter to, and this is the juicy part that everybody, everybody just showed up today because they want they want us to talk about SSPX, Society of Saint Pius X <laughs> Lefebvre. Let's get the let's get the SSPX wars flaming again. You know, let's <laughs> let's get on Twitter and attack, call people schismatic and outside the church, as has happened to both of us, um, by people who who um, I don't know if they're earnest. He says, the hidden and often silent work has been carried out by the Society of the St. Pius X, which deserves recognition for not having allowed the flame of tradition to be extinguished at a moment in which celebrating the ancient mass was considered subversive and a reason for excommunication. Its priests have been a healthy thorn in the side for a hierarchy that has seen in them an unacceptable point of comparison for the faithful a constant reproach for the betrayal committed against the people of God, an inadmissible alternative to the new conciliar path. Mic drop. Boom. 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 So, you know, it's it's been a difficult last few months because, you know, Church Militant brought out their series of reports starting around Easter of 2020, uh, allegations of the society being uh, Nazi, and a whole, I mean, at least a dozen or so uh, sexual scandals that were alleged. Right. And, and I mean, the hard, the difficult thing I think we're still trying to sift through is that there are some of the cases they discuss are act like historical cases that are documented. Yeah. They've been settled in court, but there are also new basic spec, basically speculation and a lot of hearsay. Unfortunately, a lot of the times it's presented as being all fact and uh, without doing that necessary separation of, okay, what are the historical actual documented cases versus what's being alleged now? Because there are a lot of things being alleged more recently that is a lot of he said, she said, and we don't know, you know, all the facts. There are, Sp- Stephen Cox actually from LifeSide is working, has been working for quite a while on, um, doing a, a further investigation into some of those newer allegations. So we're looking forward to when he's able to publish his findings. Yeah. And, 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 you know, I think we should be patient. Uh, you know, church militant had months and months to, to create their case and, uh, there should be months and, and also a response on the other side. Um, it, it seems that there is most certainly, 
most certainly uh, abuse that has happened, uh, sexual, grave, disgusting, horrible, satanic abuse that has happened at the hands of priests of the Society of St. Pius X. They have had priests who have left the priesthood. They have had priests who have done violent and evil things. Right. And no one should make an excuse for that. I have said, Absolutely I don't care not. if a priest has behind his name, if he has the letters FSSP, SJ, OP, Order of Preachers, OFM, Friars, Institute of Christ the King. I don't care what letters are behind his name, SSPX. If that priest molested kids, Jesus Christ already told us what to do with him. You get a big millstone. You yep. tie it around his neck and you throw him in the ocean. I didn't make that up. That's what Christ, the second person of the Trinity, said. Zero tolerance for sexual abuse in any group, any diocese, anywhere. I don't care if you're a pope, cardinal, archbishop, trad, not trad, whatever. If you use your authority, your spiritual authority as father, pater, and molest children, vulnerable adults, seminarians, whatever, I think you deserve the millstone in the, in the ocean. Absolutely. Right away, right away. But that being said, awesome there's, a lot of, there's a lot of cases that I think there needs to be some uh, more investigation, some answers, some questions and all that. And I th I'm comfortable waiting for, for the moment. I know that certain people want us to jump out and get our pitchforks and our torches and start burning down the town. But I, I think we need to take a little bit of prudence and ask some more questions and then find out. And if, let me say this, this is the big if, if leadership in the Society of St. Pius X lied, cheated, mishandled, did anything to cover up abuse, they need to publicly apologize and gracefully step down and go away and, and maybe even be punished, you know, depending on the gravity of the situation, what happens. And that's true. Again, I don't care if you're the, the letters after your name are SSPX or FSSP or Institute Christ the King or SJ. Anyone in the hierarchy who, who participates in it needs to apologize and acknowledge it and then step down or maybe even be laicized. I don't know. Depends on, on the situation. Right. Yeah. I think the main point is that, um, you know, number one, we can't be naive and think that any particular order in the in the church is completely immune from this. I mean, the, the infiltration has gone to every nook and cranny of the church. Um, but as you say, we doesn't matter what the letters are after your name. You have to be held accountable for this. Absolutely. And if think about it, if you're a demon, would you rather possess a layman or a priest? They do both. But priests are a bigger catch. Right. I imagine for a demon. And then if you started thinking, well, in 2020, who would you want to scandalize the most and who would you want to uh, compromise? The traditional movement. Right. Of course. If you have people who are saying, hey, let's, you know, reject heresy. Let's reject modernism. Let's go back to the oath of modernism. Let's have reverent celebration of the sacraments. Well, then, of course, you're going to want to subvert and infiltrate those sectors. Absolutely. Corruptio optimi pessima. Corruption of the best is the worst. Yep. Who would you rather have, a cardinal or a pope, if you're a demon? Right, exactly. And I think the other very important point to remember in, in this discussion is that the presence of those, uh, of certain wicked men among the Society of St. Pius X, if they are in fact guilty of what has been claimed, that doesn't nullify the historical record of, of what Archbishop Lefebvre and the society have done, as Archbishop Vigano acknowledges, to preserve tradition. That's simply a fact. Yeah. Uh, yeah there, there are Dominicans who have molested children and Dominicans who have covered up abuse. I still love the Dominican order. Right. Right? I'm not going to say I will never attend a Dominican mass ever again. Right. And it's, it's, it's a principle because if you take that principle and you, and you extend it right. 
you ultimately get to, well, I will never receive communion in this diocese, or I will never receive communion in relation to the USCCB. Or but ultimately, never... leads, it leads to a rejection of the entire hierarchy. Exactly. Of you you, you yeah. end up with sort of a reverse set of a contism at that point, where you don't receive communion or go to Mass anywhere. Right. You know, you could say, well, in, in Detroit, the bishop, you know, there was invalid baptisms. Right. So you should never attend liturgy in Detroit? I don't think that's the conclusion. Certainly not the correct one. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, the, the, right. <laughs> the correct solution is find orthodoxy, find where the sacraments are reverently right. and validly celebrated, and go there. Right. So I, do, I did want to read uh, what Archbishop uh, Vigano had to say about specifically Archbishop Lefebvre, because I mm -hmm. think it's a pretty historic yes. statement, and it's the first time that he's ever commented on this publicly. He said, quote, I consider Archbishop Lefebvre an exemplary confessor of the faith, and I think that by now it is obvious that his denunciation of the Council and the modernist apostasy is more relevant than ever. On the flip side, I do think it's significant to note that Archbishop Vigano, by saying that, doesn't mean that he thinks that the rest of the church's hierarchy, out, like outside the SSPX, there are no good clergy. Absolutely not. That's not what he's saying. He says numerous places in this letter, uh, I was going to find one where he says there are, basically there are good Orthodox clergy in every diocese. Uh, you recently taught, you know, you featured a priest, uh, what was his name, Father James Altman, who yeah, gave James a dynamite Altman. sermon. Everybody support Father James Altman. Yes. Dynamite. So the Arch Archbishop Vigano is not saying, you know, the, the ridiculous caricature like outside the SSPX there is no salvation or the SSPX claims to be the eternal Rome, which is actually not what Archbishop Lefebvre ever said. He said that he clings to the eternal Rome, meaning the perennial, perennial magisterium. So that's Archbishop Vigano is, has a very balanced view of this, I think. Yeah. I think uh, I, I thought that was it was a nice... Tribune, of course, uh, last week we also saw the uh, reporting, I think it was Micah Hickson, is that right? Where she said a cardinal said that one it day, is, yep. one day Le Archbishop Marcel Lefebvre will be canonized as a saint. Cardinal and re and uh, recognized as a doctor of the church. That's according to this, uh, a German, I think it's a German professor of philosophy. He also does some correspondence for a, a German news outlet from Rome. Mm -hmm. He claims... Uh, that and and Micah confirmed this with him that a a current cardinal in the College of Cardinals right now is the one who said that. Do you so that's, don't say on the line, Matt? But do you know who it is? I personally do not, but I think uh, Dr. Hickson does. But she can't obviously; she's not at liberty to say it publicly because he wants to remain anonymous at this point. Hopefully, someday he will make himself known. I, I, I'm pretty sure I think I know who it is, but of course, we're not going to say. Right. But there is one cardinal saying that right now. Uh, another, I thought, great quote in here was, uh, he says, I also agree with the observation of His Excellency Bishop Bernard Tissier de Malaray. Did I say that right? Yep, de Malaray. Yep. About the co-presence of two entities in Rome. The Church of Christ has been occupied and eclipsed. That's the language of Our Lady of La Salette. You can read the whole mystery in the appendix of my book, Infiltration. It's hard to find. I put it there. Eclipsed by the modernist conciliar structure, which has established itself in the same hierarchy and uses the authority of its ministers to prevail over the spouse of Christ our, and our mother. Right. The Church of Christ, which not only subsists in the Catholic Church, that's a, this dig is a on, sucker punch from that's a, <laughs> that's a left hook to Lumen Gentium, but is exclusively the Catholic Church is only obscured and eclipsed by a strange, extravagant church established in Rome according to the vision of Blessed and Catherine Emmerich. Yep. So here he's appealing to a private revelation. I always feel a little bit uneasy about that. But in this case, I, I think that, you know, he's using two private revelations here. He's using uh, Our Lady of La Salette, which says the Church of Rome will be eclipsed. And then he's also yep. talking about the strange, extravagant church uh, that Blessed and Catherine Emmerich saw coming in the future in Rome. Yes. Oh, and here's the statement. It's actually in this same paragraph further down where he talks about good clergy in all the dioceses. He says, quote, 
There are many laity who are raising their voice. Others will necessarily follow, please God, together with good priests, certainly present in every diocese. So very clearly saying it's not, you know, there are good clergy everywhere. And he goes on to say, this awakening of the church militant, I would dare to call it almost a resurrection, is necessary, urgent, and inevitable. No son tolerates his mother being outraged by the servants or his father being tyrannized by the administrators of his goods. The Lord offers us in these painful situations the possibility of being his allies in fighting this holy battle under his banner. The king who is victorious over error and death permits us to share the honor of triumphal victory and the eternal reward that derives from it after having endured and suffered with him. And I immediately think of Romans chapter 8 where it talks about uh, we will reign with him provided we suffer with him. I forget the exact verse. Yeah. It's like verse 17 somewhere in there. No cross, no crown. Yep. Yep. Yeah, and in the resurrection here, you know, I've heard holy priests, I've, I think I've heard Bishop Schneider refer to the eclipse of the church as the passion of the church. Yes. So there'll be a passion of the church, there'll be a moment in which all is dark, and then after three days, a resurrection. And that's the language, of course, that Bishop uh, Archbishop Vigano uses. Uh, in this paragraph that you you quoted, I thought it was interesting. In the next paragraph, he appeal he talks about the Cristeros in Mexico, yeah, and the Catholics in Spain, and the uh, sailors at Lepanto, yep. And, he and says, also he brings up Vienna as well. Yeah, in Vienna, yep. and he says it was also necessary to take up arms. Mm -hmm. We are taught <laughs> this by the strenuous resistance to repel the Islamic invasions in Lepanto, etc. So I was thinking, like, oh, he's going to talk about the rosary here. No, I think he's actually talking about <laughs> uh, nations taking up arms against international foes. Do right. You? He d I mean, he does say in most cases it is essentially a spiritual battle, but right. over the course of history we have seen how often, faced with the violation of the sovereign rights of God and the liberty of the church, it was also necessary to take up arms. So that's not outside the realm of possibility. Pretty bold statement, definitely. Yep. Certainly not one that James Martin is going to get yep. behind. <laughs> not one, not one that you're likely to hear issued from the USCCB. <laughs> uh, he he um, he calls everyone to the virtue of fortitude, and he gives us the Greek Andrea, which literally has to do. Ha, it literally derives from the word for man. Yep. Andrea, the name Andrew means manly. Yep. So fortitude is a certain manliness. He says, in knowing how to resist the modernist, a resistance that is rooted in charity and truth, which are attributes of God. Yes. So in order to be Andrea, to be manly, and to fight the modernist, we must be rooted in the attributes of God, charity and truth. Beautiful. I think what, what spoke to me the most as a layman, as a father, a husband, and I think this is why this letter is so important for, uh, for all the viewers to read in full, especially towards the end, he talks about, quote, the lay faithful today have a sacred task. Love it. I, I love that language. And here's what the sacred task is, according to Vigano. He says, quote, to comfort good priests and good bishops. You just spoke about that the other day yep. in reference to Father Altman. Gathering like sheep around their shepherds. Give them hospitality. Help them. Console them in their trials. Issue a, what you referred to as a financial interdict against the diocese if they're going to start messing with the good clergy we get we have to use what means we have to say no this is unacceptable uh archbishop vigano goes on to say and this is so important especially for traditionalists to hear create community in which murmuring and division do not predominate we must grow in humility and charity and that's what he says but rather fraternal charity in the bond of faith. You know, if, if the traditionalist movement has an Achilles heel, I think this is it right here. He's pride. summed it up right there. The pride. Yep. And I, again, like you, join with Michael, Matt, and others. Unite the clans. Yep. Unite the clans. 
we agree on 99.95 percent of everything you know and to get into fights over you know do y'all say the second confidior do y'all wear a beretta whatever nonsense it's nonsense it's total not do you yeah i mean gotta stop even when it comes and you all know how hardcore i am about pre-55 holy week even on those things guys we are in a war and people are getting spiritually slaughtered unite the clans it's an appeal we must unite the clans and work together we must listen with our ears to the callings of good shepherds like archbishop vigano Yep. To listen to them. He doesn't want us divided. He wants us united. That's one of the reasons why he writes this. Mm -hmm. And to separate out from the herd and start taking shots inward. No, you're not on the team if you do that. Mm -mm. This is 2020, folks. So I know there's people going to watch this and I'm not going to like two iotas of what you said or I said or whatever. Spare us. Spare us. Unite the clans. Amen. To I like one of my favorite lines in the whole thing uh, was a little bit before what you just quoted. He says, "If you only celebrate the traditional mass and preach sound doctrine without ever mentioning the council, what can they ever do to you?" That's right. And Reminds says, me of that says, verse from the Psalms where he says um, something like, "My trust is in God. What can man do to me?" Right. Something. What like can that. they do to you? And he says, "Throw you out of your churches, perhaps, and then what?" No one can ever prevent you from renewing the holy sacrifice, even if it is on a makeshift altar in a cellar or an attic, as the refractory priests did during the French Revolution, or as it happens still today in China. And if they try to distance you, resist. Canon law serves to guarantee the government of the church in the pursuit of its primary purposes, which, by the way, which is, is the salvation, salvation of, of souls. souls. Did yes. Jinx. Not to <laughs> demolish it. You owe me a coat. Okay. <laughs> Let's stop fearing that the fault of the schism lies with those who denounce it. Hey, the pool's cloudy, the pool's cloudy. And not instead with those who carry it out. The ones who are schismatics and heretics are those who wound and crucify the mystical body of Christ, not those who defend it by denouncing the executioners. Yep. That's right. That's it, man. So yes, there you could create so many awesome images with quotes. This is such a quotable. All document. you guys make make no nope, don't make nasty memes. Make respectful, dignified memes. And you you guys out there, these young millennials that make memes, you guys have so much material in this. So go to go to Catholic Family News and pull out some of these quotes because there is there's some great ones in here. The the memes next week on Twitter. Are go- and Facebook are going to be awesome. And he, he yeah. ends by saying, the cure for rebellion is, what would you think he would say here, folks? He says, obedience. The cure for ob- rebellion is obedience. Rightly understood obedience. The cure yes. for heresy is faithfulness to the teaching of tradition. Tradition! <laughs> <laughs> and then the very last line is just, it's a kill shot. Thank you, Archbishop Vigano. Archbishop Vigano, we thank you. He says, let's not forget that if it is the duty of the laity to obey their pastors, it is even a more grave duty of the pastors to obey God. Usque ad fusionum sanguinis, even unto the pouring out of blood. Carlo Maria you can know archbishop that's it that's it my friends so be if, of good cheer the gospel if you want a real apostolic exhortation this document is it yeah this document is a real exhortation from a successor of the apostles to live the faith authentically mm-hmm. and uh, it fires me up yep i'm fired up so thank you, Archbishop Vigano. We love you. We pray for you. Homework for everyone. Giving you your homework that you don't have to do because I have no authority, but I like to give homework. <laughs> I'm a professor by trade. Your homework is to pray at least one decade for His Excellency, 
Archbishop Vigano. Can you do that out there in the comments, in your live feed? Can y'all pray one decade for the protection and spiritual blessing and charisms for Archbishop Vigano? I know he would appreciate it, and uh, we should all do it. So you going to do it, Matt? You're going to do a decade for Vigano? Absolutely. Awesome. Absolutely. Awesome. All right, well, let's just remind people, Matt Gaspers, you're at Catholic Family News. It's a great newspaper. It's a print newspaper. Print newspapers are cool. All you young people who've never heard, seen one. <laughs> uh, Catholic Family News is a, a cool newspaper, and um, they featured online this breaking, I guess it's exclusive, right? Exclusive response from Vegan O. Currently is. We have yeah. a, I know we've had at least one request for a reprint, so it'll probably hopefully be circulating around on different sites as well. Awesome. But uh, we were honored to be the first one to publish it. Perfect. Good job on that, guys. Good, very good job. Thank you And uh, everybody go to Catholic Family News, check out the site, and uh, sign up for the newspaper. In yes. The, we 20... also do, we do a weekly news roundup as well on our YouTube channel. Check that out as well. We try to do a kind of a summary of the week's big news stories in the church and also in secular news. Like last week, we covered a lot of the, the Republican National Convention because it was just so amazing. Um, it was awesome. Careful, yes. YouTube will squeeze you if you do that. That's right. <laughs> if you say the word T-R-U-M, fill in the rest with your mind, YouTube yeah. going to get you, get you, <laughs> choke you out. That's what happens on YouTube. Well, that's a good reminder for me to say, hey, Everybody, YouTube is not sharing my videos or helping me out. They're suppressing it. So, hey, get, hit a thumbs up. Tell YouTube you like it anyway. And then share this video because they're not sharing it. So go on right below the video. There's a share button. If you're on Twitter, just retweet it. But if you're on YouTube, share and then share it on Facebook. That seems to be the best way to do it. Lots of people on Facebook. So if you share it, then they'll see this on Facebook, this video. They'll click on it. They'll watch it. And... uh there you go. You said someone watched a Vigano video. And then if you're new, if you're on YouTube, hit the subscribe button and hit the bell. If you're on Facebook, just like the page. If you're on Twitter, uh, follow me on Twitter. Follow me on Periscope. Whatever you like to do, however you get your info, do it that way. So, shall we pray? Sounds good. Let's do the Great Ave, discussion. Ave Maria and Gloria Patri. You want to do second half? Matt Gasper. Will do, yeah. All right, oremus. In nomine Patris et Fidei et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Ave Maria, gratia plena Dominus tecum, benedicta tu in mulieribus, et benedictus fructus ventris tui, Jesus. Sancta Maria, Mater Dei, ora pro nobis peccatoribus, nunc et in hora mortis nostre. Amen. Gloria Patri et Filio et Spiritui Sancto. Sicud erat in principio, et nunc, et semper, et in secula seculorum. Amen. Almighty God, we pray for Archbishop Figano, and we ask that you would rain down blessings, graces, charisms upon him and upon his apostolic ministry, and upon everyone watching, that you would please bless us in your mercy and draw us all closer to the sacred heart of Jesus. We pray in his name. Amen. Nomine Amen. Patris et Fidei et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Amen. All right, everybody. Thanks for watching. And make sure that you are praying the rosary every single day. If you don't pray the rosary, guess what, Matt Gaspers? You're not on the team. You've got to pray the rosary every day. It is the weapon against all heresies. What is modernism? The synthesis of all heresies. It's, it's all the heresies mixed up into a pot. So how do we beat that? The weapon against all heresies the rosary. That's why Pius X wanted everybody praying the rosary all the time. Leo XIII. Pray the rosary every day. You're not on the team. And your homework is one of those decades goes to Archbishop Vigano. All right, yes. everybody. Thanks so much. Thanks to Matt Gaspers. Thanks for being on, Matt. Thank you for having me. It was a pleasure. And remember, our Lord Jesus Christ said you are the light of the world and the salt of the earth. So go out there and be salty. Till next time, God bless and Godspeed.